Tell about the park where you used to work. Okay, so I think if I talk about the park, I need to give the backstory because it wasn't like I woke up one morning and decided I'm going to go and work with lions. I, I didn't, you know, as a kid, uh, animals are always part of my everyday existence, but more domestic animals, you know. So I met a guy, he was coming to me for rehabilitation and uh, he had bought a lion park. And it was just like matter of fact, oh, I bought a lion park. I was like, oh, okay. Well, if you want to go and visit it, you know, you're more than welcome. So I was like, yeah, that sounds intriguing. You know, I hadn't known of the, of the lion park because it had been a kind of like a go-to place for tourists since the 60s. And so um, I, I went there and uh, got shown around and then uh, ultimately um, ended up at this, this area, um, off limits area, where these two lion cubs were and they were six months old. And they, I was like, well, why are these guys here? And they were like, no, they've just come off public display. And now they at this area where the public can't interact with them anymore. And those two lions became town Napoleon, became my, br my brother lions, as many people who follow me would know, you know. And I had no idea um, the impact that these animals would have on my life. If you had have asked me the day before, would, you know, the meeting of these two lion cubs, would you see yourself 20 odd years later talking to Graham <laughs> about your life working with lions? I would have said, are you a bit uh, right. mishugger, you know, in the head? And yeah, and that, that's, that's what happened. And I, I, I got so entrenched and so involved because the guy basically said to me, listen, you can see it's had a profound impact. Go and visit as much as you want. And so I took, up, I took him up on that opportunity and I went to visit these lines every single day. The connection, you know, we talked about it today. And, and slowly but surely, these lines got bigger and bigger and months and months went by and other lines came into the equation. And uh, before I knew it, I was spending more time at that park than doing anything else. How did you find out what they were doing with the lions? I used to hear murmurings of the dark underbelly of this lion business and used to think, not this place, not this place. This is a place where town Napoleon live, and this is, a, this is good. Slowly but surely, you start to see things that you, you're not happy with, uh, but you, you bite your lip. Um, and then ultimately, as the, the, the months and years tick by, you start to see things that you really uh, can't digest. I think the final straw for me was when Meg and Amy, who you met today, got sold from under my nose. I went away on holiday, I came back. Maggie, Amy, nothing. Um, you saw them today, they come, that was always the norm. Come to the enclosure, call Maggie, Amy, and they would be there. And so take me through that whole story and how you called that one of the defining moments of your life. Definitely a defining moment. I, um, I came back, they were gone, I kicked up a huge fuss. Uh, I could not let this go. I had, obviously I had choices like we all do in life. And uh, the choices were um, do nothing, accept and carry on or get them back. And for me, it wasn't a choice. I got them back. I said, I don't care what it takes. And I didn't, you know, mentally think it over. Uh, it wasn't like I calculated this plan. It was just instinct. I just like, lines gone, need to get lines back. I'm getting these lines back. I don't care what it takes. And, and so off, off I went to, I mean, it, 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 the long story is the guy who took the lines, brought them back. Or what he thought was the lines. Correct. And I looked at these lines and I said, it's not Megan Amy. And I think there was the start of the shock of, well, how do you know? How do you know which two lines they are? You know, and I said to him, they're not Megan Amy. And uh, eventually after much arguing, it was uh, decided that I would go and get them. And so off I went with a colleague of mine <laughs> all the way to this area, two and a half hours away, and you know, rocked up at this guy's farm. And that was the first time I saw the real um, effects of the industry. What did you see? Just a systematically um, set out business whereby very cleanly and neatly thought out, enclosure after enclosure after enclosure, all different age group animals. You know, I'll never forget it. I was led through this passage and on either side, these lines were 
you know, not just ones and twos. It was just lions, so numbers of 20s and 15s. And I mean, I subsequently found out that this, li this park had over 450 lions. And I think to myself, I've got 25 currently, and it's a full-time job looking after these animals properly. How do you look after 450 plus lions properly? Anyway, um, get to Megan Amy's enclosure uh, where he says they are. And there's just a sea of lions in this barren enclosure with like this structure that is not enough shade to give to all the animals. So some of them are lying in the baking hot sun. And uh, he's like, yeah, well, here we are. We're your lions. And I called Maggie, Amy, and out of this sea of lions, because none of them, none, none of the other lions knew my voice. Two lions like, oh my gosh, he's back. And they came running at, at pace to the fence, talking and, you know, <laughs> the, the usual, you back, you back, you know, and I was like, that's Meg and that's Amy. And he was like, he was, I, th I think, visibly shocked by there's something going on here, you know what I'm saying? It's more, and, and I suppose the next question then was, how do you get these lions home? Because we didn't come prepared with uh, darting equipment to drug them. So it was really a question of, I often joke about it and say, if people call me the line whisperer, but if at any point in my career I needed to put line whispering skills to, to the test, it was then. Because mm -hmm. I kind of looked at Meg and, and, and Amy and said, you better get in that box. Because if you don't get in that box, probably all likelihood you're going to be left here. <laughs> opened the gate, opened the crate, and in went Meg, closed the crate, put it on the back, looked at Amy, your turn. Opened the, she got in, closed it, put them on the back. No small talk, off, off we raced back home. Because they trusted you. There was a trust. I mean, there was definitely. But if I could tell you, Graham, the condition that they were in, in two weeks, compared to when I'd left, it was horrendous. You know, driving back, it was when, it, you know, after that adrenaline rush, you kind of like start to um, relax and the mind starts to go, what just happened and I think you know the big realization driving back I was speaking to my colleague I was like I don't own the animals I have relationships with that's the first problem there's no ownership it's I've got relationships but there's a big difference because you can't then control how they're cared for 100 percent right. if you don't if you don't own you don't control so what's to stop this from happening again I realized that um, you know, ownership was a necessity. I didn't have the mechanisms or the means. So what, what, what were you going to do? You know, so that, that was the issue. How did you go about figuring it out? Well, I had a good enough relationship with the guy, the owner, um, to, to influence um, him. And I thought I can get this park to stop doing what they're doing. I think we can... Um, show them the wrongs of their ways and rehabilitate this place. And, and, and this owner whose name is Rodney was a wealthy businessman who brought you from uh, being a personal trainer to him to into this lion park world. world. Yeah. And, and I will, you know, let's not beat around the bush. He was good to me and was like a father to me. Um, and I, it, it was that age-old conflict between father and son where, you know, I often use the, the example of if your father was running a successful clothing business and you were young and didn't really understand the business and then you found out that actually the product was as a result of child labor, slave labor, what would you do? And you couldn't do anything about it. Would you confront your dad and say, hey, dad, listen, I found this out. This is not cool. And he, so you have a choice there whereby it's either, well, you tow the line, son, or go and find yourself a job because this is the way we do it. Mm -hmm. But son thinks he can rehabilitate the father and, and get him to think things differently. How did that go? Well, I, I thought I had a good shot at it. And I, I think he would have... I think the problem being is the 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 momentum and power of this business um, depended heavily on the um, breeding of these animals for tourism. And I think they thought that without that, the business would fail. And many, many years later, way after I had left, they did try that. 
they, they said publicly in the news, in newspapers, they're going to stop breeding uh, prolifically. They're going to stop the perpetual breeding, breed very limited amount of lines, and they're going to stop the cub petting. And I was like, I'm good for that. Hallelujah. Right. I mean, this is what I wanted all those years back. So I'm, I'm glad you finally came around to your senses. But they moved parks started that and then slowly but surely i heard from um, a few of my sources that they sli they silently brought it back in and thought that no one would notice and uh, they had this whole um feeling of well if you can't beat them join them you know and, and until such time as it's banned completely why should we stop it right which kind of for me is a bit disingenuous because why did you stop it then? They said that the public had lost appetite mm -hmm. for for um, petting. Right. And I looked at that and I said, no, 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 no. The public hasn't lost appetite for petting because they need to be educated about that. But that's a situation where government can step in and create policy that puts it to an end once and for all, hopefully. Um, yeah, but I mean, think about it, Graham. I mean, we got a government that doesn't, they've got bigger fish to fry. Yeah. There's a lot of poverty in South Africa. There's a lot of um, uh, unemployment. And, you know, the, a lot of these um, farms are offering that and tourism and there's money involved. And the other thing is that typically um, there hasn't been this notion of, you know, animals um, need to be high up on the agenda. In fact, our former president even said it's not typically African to have these animals on this level you know the animals are there to be subservient almost and and to serve a purpose so if they're serving the purpose within the tourist industry they seem to be happy but that's shifted which is a good thing i think it's shifted